You guys ready for a Christmas message today? I'm excited to be able to preach today. Um, I'm going to be sitting for a lot of the message today, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. But uh, we are today launching into a whole new series called God with us. That's, of course, what Jesus' name means is Emmanuel. It means God with us. So we're going to talk a little bit about the God with us life over the next few weeks, and I'm excited to be able to do that with you. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about how God is with us in the middle of our longings, in the middle of just all the wishing and hoping and longing that we do this time of year. And my scripture today, if you want to follow along with me, is going to be found in Isaiah chapter 40. We're going into the prophecy. We're going into, we're going into a time period before Jesus was on earth and Isaiah was predicting what it would look like. He was talking about it. And this is what he says in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone. Wouldn't it be great to just know that your sad days are gone? I think that'd be, I mean, that's, I love the Bible. You can't make that, that's just awesome. My sad days are gone. Okay, why? Because her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice for all her sins. Listen, the vo- it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight the highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout about? Shout that the people are like grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God stands forever. Isn't it good to know that there's something in this world that stands forever? My message title this morning is the comfort is in the fade. The comfort is in the fade. I'm excited for this one. Let's say a prayer and then we'll dive into it. Jesus, as we dive into this message and in this whole series, this Christmas season, would you open our hearts and open our minds to what you're doing inside of us? Be born in us anew. Speak to us today. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, is a little bit different for me, uh, kind of starting off a message where I'm sitting uh, like this and where I'm just sitting at all. I feel very, I, like I don't know what to do with myself uh, right now in my body. It's just, a, it's a little bit weird. Uh, but you may be wondering why that is the case. If that's weird, Pastor Seth, why are you doing it? Well, funny story. Love to tell you a little bit about that. This past Wednesday, okay, so like just a few days ago, I woke up and my right calf was just hurting a little bit, like I'd pulled a muscle, just kind of tweaked something. And so I I didn't think, honestly, too much uh, about it. I turned 50 back in October, sometimes uh, October. Sometimes you just wake up and stuff hurts, you know, and it goes away, and then something else hurts the next day. It's just the way it is, right? That's just kind of life sometimes. So I went about my day on Wednesday, no big deal. But but by, by Wednesday afternoon, the ache in my calf wasn't going away, And it was starting to hurt a little bit more. It was starting to swell a little bit more. By Thursday morning, I woke up and I couldn't even hardly get my pants on. My calf was so big. Just swollen up completely. And I hadn't done anything. Like I hadn't injured it. Like I, I didn't even know what was going on. It didn't really hurt. It just felt like a lot of pressure. And, and so I, you know, got dressed, went to work, and um, at the urging of a couple of people in my life, they were like, you should really get that looked at. That's not okay. It's not normal. Should, it's not, it's a kind of, a, you know, it makes you, like, have a doctor look at it. Because I was just going to sit it out. I was going to, like, ah, fine, give it the weekend, right? It's fine. No big deal. It just doesn't even really, it's not even that terrible. It's just kind of uncomfortable. I gave into it though, and so after school on Thursday, and for those of you who don't know, I teach seventh grade when I'm not here uh, preaching at second story. So after school Thursday, I drove directly to an urgent care, 
And before the doctor came and saw me, I actually kind of reached down and rubbed my calf just to make sure that, okay, it's still swollen, right? Like it's still, it's still there. Have you ever taken your car in for a noise? And then the mechanic is like, I can't, I don't know what you're talking like. It's not there. I don't know. I just wanted to make sure. Like, this is really a thing, right? I was thinking it's, it's an infection. It's not a big deal. The doctor's going to laugh me out of urgent care, and I'm out 50 bucks. Not a big deal, right? That's not, oh, well, whatever. So I just figured they were going to tell me it's, it's, it's just nothing. So here's some penicillin. The doctor felt my leg a little bit, and uh, he asked me how long this has been going on, and he said, okay. Well, let's get it looked at. And so they ordered up an ultrasound. Five minutes later, I'm laying on a bed, and they're, run they're running the ultrasound wand up and down my leg to see what's going on. As soon as she put, as soon as the tech put the wand on my thigh, first words out of her mouth were, oh my. <laughs> really? And I was like, oh, oh my what? Oh what? What's that? What are you looking at over there? I can't see the TV from where I am. You know, what's going on over there? She got real serious with me and she said, um, you're very, very, very lucky you came in today. I said, what, uh, why? That doesn't sound too good. You know, what's going on in there? She said, well, listen, I'm not supposed to say anything because I'm just a tech, but this one's pretty obvious, okay? She said, you have a very large and very acute blood clot that is starting in the, like in your mid thigh up into your groin and it stretches all the way down into your thigh. This thing is, is severe and it's a big problem and it's real serious. I was like, oh my gosh, uh, I can't believe it. I, I'm, I was a little bit in shock at, at what was going on. For those of you who don't know, the danger with blood clots, especially one that big, is that they can break apart into pieces and when they break apart, they can travel to places in your body through your circulatory system, like your lungs, your brain, and your heart. And when they get there, they cause problems like heart attacks and aneurysms. Okay, so it's, it, it's a really serious situation, and it's much, much, uh, much more severe than I thought it was going to be. I, I went from thinking like this is like just a little infection, it's going to be a giant nothing burger, how much is my copay, right, to... Seth, you're very lucky that you made it in and got seen today. And as I was, I was laying there, the tech finished her scans and she left to go get the doctor and they're interpreting results. And I'm laying there in this darkened room underneath this blanket and my whole life started flashing before my eyes. It was bizarre. I started thinking about my kids start thinking about my family, about how I'm too young for something like this to happen, how there's like, there's like maybe even two or three other people on the whole planet that even know I'm here. Like nobody even knows that I'm here right now, laying in this bed, in this dark room, with my right leg trying to kill me. Nobody even knows that. And in the middle of it all, it's just, have you ever experienced it? It's so amazing how fast your priorities can shift how much your perspective can shift. All the things that I thought I was gonna do the rest of this week, all the things that I had planned, all the, all the details and pressure I felt about my day, all the things I was worried about, all the plans that I had for Christmas presents to buy and all this kind of stuff, all the stuff to get ready for, instantly, instantly, none of it matters. None of it matters. I got dressed and I went back into the doctor's office and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm uh, shaking a little bit and, and I, I started trying to just make sense of this whole situation and process it. And the doctor's taking his time to look at the scans because he wants to be sure. So I pulled out my phone and I did what you do, you know, I started scrolling Instagram because I want to connect with the real world, <laughs> you know, a little bit. So I opened up the app, no joke. This is the very first thing. I took a screenshot of it that popped up on my phone. Can we put that up there? Oh my God. Don't be the dad without life insurance. <laughs> you loser. <laughs> Not only are you in serious peril here, but... <laughs> like, what, what, is, what is happening right now? What is going on in my life, you can't make this stuff up. Nobody knows except like two people and apparently all of Instagram, right? 
who, if you ever thought there was any doubt, they're geo-tracking you, man. They're all over you, okay? They know everything about where you're going. Like, then they're just screaming at me. It's not, it's not like a comforting Bible verse they could have popped up or something like that. It's this whole, th- it's this whole thing about, hey, as long as you're going to die, could you at least make sure you don't screw over your kids? It'd be great. It'd be awesome in the process. <laughs> So the doctor came in, I talked to him, they got me on meds, they got me stabilized, my situation is good, I'm okay uh, right now, and and much to Instagram's dismay, uh, by the way. But I'm gonna make it through this thing, and we still have to get to the bottom of why it happened, and what what was the cause of this whole thing, and that whole process starts tomorrow. Like, just asking the question of how did I go from feeling fine, strong, and healthy one minute, to the next minute having a serious sort of life-threatening situation. And so we're going to figure that out starting tomorrow morning at, at another doctor's appointment. But I just want to reassure everybody, I'm going to be okay here. All right, we've, we've got it under control. But the thing of it is, I almost wasn't. And if I'd have waited the weekend to address the problem like I was going to, there's a good chance I might not have been. You know, when you're a pastor... So much of your life revolves around the weekend. Just the logistical side of life, it kind of revolves around the weekend. And and so as I started sharing the news with a couple of people of what was going on with me, uh, one of the very first questions that came up was, hey, are you able to preach this weekend? Like, are you okay? Do we need to figure something out about that? And to me, there was never a question as to whether I was preaching. There was never a question of it. Like, I, n- I might not be able to stand so much this morning just because it gets kind of swollen and uncomfortable when I stand for long periods of time, but I need to preach this passage. I need to preach this pa- Why? Because I knew that this weekend, I knew I'm preaching about longing and about God being with us in the middle of our longing, in the middle of hard things, in the middle of how he sees our needs and knows us even better than we know ourselves. And I knew the text that I was preaching on and how this text flat out declares, it just flat out says it right there in the Bible. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. I couldn't have felt more withered and more fading in that moment. And listen, I'm not saying that God made it happen so I could preach this passage and have something to preach on this weekend. I'm not saying that was the case, but I can share with you that next week's sermon topic has been changed, and we're now going to talk about how to get insanely, ridiculously rich. Okay? That's what we're going (laughs) to talk about. Wealth generation is the next topic that we're hitting. I mean, listen, if this is how the preaching gig is going to go, Lord, then, you know, let's just have some fun with it. Okay, while well, we're at it, I'd like, just, I'd like some different illustrations, please. I, I actually, for, I actually, this is between you and me, okay? <laughs> I actually told our team I thought it would be funny if I preach from a wheelchair this morning and tell the story of, like, what happened to me and then, like, for the last point, just pop out of it, you know? <laughs> It's a Christmas miracle! It's kind of that kind of thing. We could, we could put it on Instagram and grow the church a little bit, see if that would, would happen. That's how twisted I am, man. And it, it's, it's, it's messed up. It's real messed up. I'm just grateful for people in my life who tell me that things like that are a bad idea. You know, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. But that's the reason that I'm preaching while I'm sitting today. And, and I just, what I want to do today is just share with you a little bit about what I've been thinking about regarding holiday hope in the middle of longing as I was laying on that hospital bed, getting that ultrasound on Thursday afternoon. These are the things that I've been thinking about since Isaiah 40, uh, since reading Isaiah 40 and then having what happened to me happen. Just what it means to be a human being who has longings, who those longings are real, especially at Christmas time during the holidays, because this is a time of year, isn't it, when longings have a way of kind of coming to the surface a little bit. This is the first thing I was thinking about as I was in the ultrasound room. Very first thing was this, that eternal longings are never satisfied with temporary things. Eternal longings are never satisfied with temporary things. Had you ever had a situation like the one I just described where your priorities just bloop, 
shifted like that instantly, just instantly. It's amazing how fast they can move when you're in the middle of a hard situation. It can happen just in a heartbeat. You know, a, a lot of times when pastors preach stuff like this, like this first point, they'll say things like that to their church, like eternal longings are never satisfied with temporary things. Just remember that it almost sounds a little sing-songy. It almost sounds a little like Veggie Tales if you're, you know, from the 90s and early 2000s. It, 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 it sounds a little bit cliche, and usually what follows next is a little bit of a talk about not getting caught up in the pleasures of this world. And don't you go chasing that expensive, shiny thing that you know you're chasing this Christmas season. And it's all of this kind of, this kind of talk about kind of the things of this world. And listen, don't get me wrong. A lot of that is real, and a lot of that is an issue, okay? But here's what I remembered as I was laying there on that hospital bed this past week. When I was faced with the fact, faced with a very real, tangible reminder of how fragile life is, about how you can wake up in the morning thinking your day is going to go a certain way, and it just whoosh, flips on you. All I could think about, all I could think about were my family and my friends and how my absence would affect them, and it was my connection to them. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. All the other stuff, everything else that I thought that was important about the day, all of that stuff, none of it was anymore. In fact, most of it, and maybe this is true for you too, most of it is stuff that I use, like a lot of us, to just cover up the deeper longings that we have, right? For connection, for, for meaning, for intimacy. So much of it is just covering up that longing with a lesser desire so that I feel a lot less fragile than I am. I can cover up my fragility by dealing with lesser desires than core needs. Have you ever noticed that? We have a sneaky way of trying to fulfill longings by mixing up our intentions with our outcomes in life. We just do. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having a great house or a nice car or improving your situation financially. There's nothing wrong with God blessing you materially. Nothing wrong with that at all. Even if they are temporary things, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But those are outcomes of a life, okay? Th those are good outcomes. They're terrible intentions. Let me explain what I mean, okay? If I try to fulfill my longing for connection, for intimacy, for meaning, and it, with, with just kind of filling it up with stuff, if I let myself get caught up in that kind of thinking, there was never going to be enough stuff to ever fulfill that longing. There never will be. There's always going to be someone also who has more than me. And so I'm going to get caught up in the comparison game. If I get caught up in thinking that, man, if I just have more money, that's where the answer is going to be, right? Like having more money is the answer. Here's the problem. That's never going to be enough either. That's going to drive me to a place of insecurity. That's going to drive me to a place of inadequacy. Because when your money is your intention instead of an outcome of you living inside of your purpose, you're, it's going to drive you into selfishness. And it's going to drive you into greed. And it's going to drive you into a whole different kind of insecurity, if the accumulation of things or accomplishments becomes my intention instead of my outcome, then you know what's going to happen to you? Your life is never going to measure up. You never will measure up. There's always going to be one more thing to do, one more hill to climb, one more level to get to, and all of it is going to take you away from becoming the person that you, honest to goodness, were meant to to be the healthiest version of yourself where your outcomes of your life are flowing out of, out of the purpose that you were created for. You're going to get these things jacked up and reversed. And here's the thing, you know, pe people go through different phases of life in terms of what we value. When, when we're kids, when we're little kids, what we value in life is getting things. And when we're reaching adolescence, as you start moving through that, life becomes more about getting or gaining experiences in, in, in moving through the journey of life. But then you reach maturity and, and you realize when you start to get a little more mature that life is really more about people. It's more about relationships. It's more about enjoying the things and experiences with 
the people, right? The problem that a lot of people have is that even as they get older, they never really de- like develop in what, they de- in what they value. So we're getting older, but what we value isn't developing. So they will be all about acquiring things even though they should have moved on to experiences, right? Erwin McManus says that they're no longer about Legos, they're about Lamborghinis, right? They just, they get older and the toys get more expensive. Anybody say amen to that? Yeah, buddy. They do. They do. Or they get stuck in adolescence. And and so what happens to these people is the reason that they might be 35 years old and they keep churning and churning and churning through relationship after relationship in their life is that it looks like they value people. But the reality is what they're really valuing is the experience. And as a result, they're churning through relationships they don't know how to deal with. They don't know how to steward it. They don't know how to walk in it in the long term. They don't know how to make it last or take it to the next level because they never really make it about people. It's still about the experience. Are you with me, church? Okay. So it says in Isaiah 40, chapter 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her, that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Sad days are gone and sins are pardoned. Is that good news to anybody? It is good news. But why? Why are her sad days over? Because her sins have been pardoned. Well, what, has, what does sin do? What's the primary effect of sin? Sin separates us from God and it separates us from each other. Sin is first and foremost a relational problem. Always is. Always is. It's the relationships in life that are most deeply affected by it. That's why Jesus, in the New Testament, Jesus says that if you love God and love each other, you fulfill all the law and all the prophets. Just work on the relational side of life. If you get those relationships right, you love each other well, you love God well, you're gonna get everything else right along the way. Why? Because every longing you have, every longing to be seen, every longing to be known, the longing to be loved, the longing to be accepted, the longing to be connected, the longing to have a purpose, the longing to be whole and holy and healed, these are longings that God designed in us to, fu- to only be fulfilled in relationship to him and relationship to each other. So, When you go to the family get-together at Christmas, come on, and you feel sad, or you're sitting alone on New Year's and you just feel that, the longing inside of you, the longing to have a purpose, the longing to be whole and holy and fulfilled, these are things that God says, listen, you can only fulfill inside of a relationship with me and a relationship with with other people. That's why the Bible says that it's not good for man to be alone. Because you've got these longings inside of you that are like loose electrical wires, that they're just like, they're blowing around in the wind. And, and, and the Bible says that it's not good for that to have that. Why? Because we need to hardwire those things into the right sources to get them fulfilled, and you can't do it outside of relationship with him and with others. When I was laying on that hospital bed last Thursday, nothing else mattered to me other than the relationships in my life. Nothing. Instantly, I no longer care about what year my car is, (laughs) what the details of the Christmas services are here at church. I mean, it's important. We've got to figure that out. We're there, right? All I care about is being connected to the people I love and having them connected with me. It happens so fast. All that other stuff, all the other stuff, it's just layers and layers and layers and layers that piles up on top of that core longing. So Jesus coming to earth as a baby means our sad days are over. Why? Because we now have the grace to connect with God and connect with each other. God is showing us the way to strip through all those layers, just dig down underneath all the core of all of it and get to the stuff and experience that he has given us to have. Your sadness, the sadness that you have. Here's what I want you to be thinking about as you go through your holiday season, okay? The sadness that you experience this season, it's not about your lack of stuff and your lack of experiences. 
It's about your lack of connection and your longing for intimacy. It got real quiet in here, right? Those are the issues that Jesus came to address. And it leads us to the second part of Isaiah 40, where what you're longing for is on the other side of the work you haven't done. What you're longing for is on the other side of the work you have not done. Check out what it says in Isaiah chapter 40, just just verses 3 through 5, okay? It says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valley and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. What's the good news? Well, the good news is the announcement of the birth of Jesus, that your sad days are over, that sin has been dealt with, that we have connection with God, that we have connection with each other. That's what God has done, okay? God's job is that. But then Isaiah has the audacity to suggest that there's some other parts of this equation that are our part of the problem to deal with. We've got some obstacles in life that need to be cleared out. There are some things that are crooked inside of us that need to be straightened out. There's some valleys that need to be filled in. Mountains that are in the way. Big old mountains. You know what they are. We need to level those. We've got to smooth out the ground a little bit. We've got some rough stuff, some rough pieces inside of us. These things need to be sanded down and smoothed out, right? Whose job is it to do that? Who gets that job? We do. We do, okay? That's us. This whole passage in Isaiah 40, it's all about the announcement that Jesus is coming to earth and is good news. And it's all about Jesus' birth and sending Jesus and forgiving sins and all of that stuff. That's God's part. Who is all of this straightening, leveling, moving, and smoothing stuff aimed at? Us. Us. Thank you. (laughs) Right? It's all aimed at us. God says, listen, come on. I can give you the gift, but you got to prepare yourself to receive it. I can give it to you, but you better get ready because I can't give you what you're not willing to receive, okay? I can give you the connection that you're so deeply wanting, but you're going to have to get into prayer and to counseling and to therapy and to self-awareness and all kinds of stuff if you're going to be able to receive it. I can give you the intimacy that you're longing for, but come on now, you've got a clot in your system that if you don't clear that sucker out, if you don't deal with that thing once and for all, that thing is going to travel to your heart, it's going to travel to your brain, it's going to travel to your lungs, and it's going to affect the way that you think and that you, you work and that you, you relate inside of your relationships. It's going to give you a spiritual heart attack and a heart-related aneurysm. All kinds of stuff is going to be going on in there. we got to get rid of the blockage that is in the way. You need to do the work in you. You need to figure out what the problem is and stop being so afraid of dealing with it once and for all. Would you just stop blowing it off and treating it like it's not a big deal. And today is just another day. Stop thinking you can wait the weekend to get this thing looked at it, and would you get yourself to urgent care and get that junk cleaned out, please? Your deepest longings are only going to be fulfilled to the extent that you're able to break down that blockage. That's the honest truth. God says, listen, I can give it to you, but you're going to have to work with me to get it to you. Okay? When the Bible says about Jesus' birth that I want you to clear the way in the wilderness, clear the way. This is not a metaphor, okay? This is not like some kind of sing song, make way for Prince Ali. That is not what's going on here, okay? This is not Aladdin. This is a literal command. If you want the longing fulfilled, then there's work you've got to do. You don't have to work to earn it. You don't have to work to earn it. The grace is the gift being given to you for free. That's why it's called grace, okay? 
But you do have to work to live in that grace more deeply in your life. Why? Because being given the gift of grace and not living in the gift of grace are two entirely different things. Being given the gift and living it out. Two very, very different things. Are you with me, church? Okay. How many times in a state of longing, come on, if we're just honest with ourselves, do we look at other people and we think things to ourselves like, oh, yeah, it must be nice. Right? Ah, it must, must be nice to have that kind of life. Must be nice to have those kinds of friends or that kind of family. Must be nice to have that kind of, kind of marriage. Like, we get into our minds that the reason we don't have these things and that other people do have these things is because they're just lucky or that God just blessed them over us because, you know, we, there's no way we're ever going to have anything like that. And when we get into that kind of mindset, what happens is this. It drives us deeper into covering up our core longing with lesser desires. It's going to drive you deeper into hiding because you're giving yourself an excuse to leave all those stinky blockages up. It must be nice to have those kinds of friends. It is. It is nice to have those kinds of friends. It is nice to have that kind of a family. It is possible to have that kind of a marriage. You know how the people who have those families and friends and marriages, you know how they got it? They did the work, okay? Or they're doing the work. The only reason they have those things and you feel like you don't is because they remove the blockages that are keeping them from it. They smoothed out some of the rough stuff. They straightened out what was jacked up and crooked inside of them. When I was laying in, in that hospital bed, do you think that there's anything I wouldn't have done to remove any kind of barrier to anything that stood between my kids and I? There's not a thing I wouldn't have done. When you start getting real about how short life is and how fragile it is and how your day can turn on a dime, what becomes crystal clear to you almost instantaneously is that from the time you woke up this morning to the time you go to bed tonight, that kind of connection with human beings and with God is your only and primary job. That's it. That is why you are here, okay? That kind of connection is your one and only job. It's your primary purpose. The life that you're longing for is on the other side of the work that you're avoiding. And until we stop thinking that it's just going to magically appear in our lives, we're never going to step into it. So stop thinking that you can give that blockage the weekend because that sucker is going to travel on you, Okay? And it's going to affect your thinking. It's going to affect your relationship and your heart and your emotions. It's going to seize you up all about God's grace. And you're going to get all jacked up and you're thinking about it. And you're going to get envious of the freedom that other people live in that you don't. And that's a tough place to be. Because you're never going to live it out yourself. But you're just going to watch it as other people do. Because here's what we're scared of. And here's what we don't want to admit. You ready for this? I'm going to leave you on this one. That the comfort is in the fade. The comfort is in the fade. I want you to listen to how this passage begins. Okay? And then I want you to hear the way this passage ends. As Isaiah is announcing, he's prophesying the birth of Jesus. This is how Isaiah begins and ends these verses. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Okay? And then it ends with, the grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord, and so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord, the word of God, stands forever. So the passage starts out, check this out, by saying, hey, everybody who's longing for anything, I've got comfort for you. I've got a lot of comfort i got to tell you about. And then it ends with, we're all going to die, shrivel, fade, and check out of planet Earth. How is that comforting? Right? Where is the comfort? In fact, I love it. Even in verse 6, if we back it up a verse, it says, a voice said, shout. I said, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to shout? What is there to shout about with this? This doesn't seem comforting at all. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It seems terrible. 
This seems like bad news, right? How is the fact that we wither and fade comforting? You've lost your mind, Isaiah. How is it comforting to be laying on a spiritual hospital bed when nobody knows you're there? It's comforting because Isaiah says, God knows. How is it comforting to have the longings in me that are just these wild wires of electric stuff going on? It's like, how is it comforting to know that they're unfulfilled? It's comforting because God sees them and he's willing to do the work with you to connect them. How is it comforting to know that whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow or whether it's next week or whether it's 50 years from now, that my life one day is going to end and that I'm going to be sitting in that hospital bed one final time and that I might not get out that particular time and that my life can be cut down like a lawnmower cuts grass. God says the comfort isn't in the cutting. The comfort is in the connection. The comfort, he says, is in the connection. You're right. People do wither. People do fade. But I don't. And now, in Jesus, I've made a way for you to stay connected, not to the withery stuff, not to the fading stuff. I've made a way for you to stay connected to what doesn't fade. And that's me. The word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus, the Bible says, is the word made flesh. His spirit is the breath of life, the ruach of God. The word of the Lord stands forever. So listen to me. As you fade out, as you fade out, guess what else fades out? Longing fades out into fulfillment. Desire fades out into purpose. Hurt fades out into healing. Anxiety fades out into hope. Depression fades out into victory. Disconnection fades away and is replaced by intimacy. How are longings fulfilled at Christmas? They're fulfilled in you learning to trust the fade. They're fulfilled in you learning how to let go of yourself in all the ways that you're trying to fulfill your longings outside of him and trust that with everything you are, everywhere you go, in everything you do, that I need to have more of God and less of me and more of God and less of me. I need to fade out. He needs to fade in. I need to allow the fade so that it's more of God and less of me. You know, when I was in the urgent care that afternoon, you know what I wasn't thinking? I wasn't thinking, man alive, I'm sure glad I accumulated enough stuff in my life. I sure wish I would have visited Australia. I always wanted to go to Australia. Maybe I don't know if I will now. It just doesn't look like it. This is bad news, you know. I sure wish, I sure wish I would have made more money. I sure wish I would have been wealthier in my life. I just wish I could have driven a newer car before I died. I wish that. I'm sure glad I was successfully avoiding all of my problems all the way to the end. Man alive, I had everybody fooled. Everybody thought I was okay and I was doing well and I had so much stuff and I had so many experiences. And they, that's how you have a full life. You share with everybody, that's how, every, how, how you get a full life. But by what you had and, and what you did, right? Can I tell you a secret? Nobody thinks that when they're laying in that bed. Nobody. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, my kids, my family, my friends. Did I love them well enough? Did I get enough of my blockages out of the way so that even if this is where I fade out, that they would know 
that I trusted God enough to allow myself to be loved so that he could get his love into me and through me to them? Did I connect with them at that level? That's Isaiah 40. That those in the hospital can take comfort because you're never in the room alone. I'm never in a relationship alone. I'm never in church alone. I'm never in a family gathering alone. I never face an addiction alone by myself. I never face a problem alone. I never have a longing alone. My comfort, my comfort, my comfort is in my ability to fade, to just fade. Because here's what I find out. The more I fade out and the more he fades in, you know what I find out? is that I become more of myself than I ever could have on my own. I become more of the person that he called me to be. My comfort is in my ability to fade. I know that someday I'm gonna lay in a bed like the one I was in on Thursday, and that's all that's gonna matter. All that's going to matter is what did I find my comfort in? And did I ever really grab a hold of where it really is? Jesus says that the one who loses his life will find it. That's what Jesus came to do. To show us how to do that as well. I'm only fine because God was urgent about my situation and my separation from him when I wasn't. And you know what my comfort is as a result? My comfort is that in learning to trust God with the fade in him I'm going to find my purpose and that God doesn't desire to drown me out that I, as I trust him and allow him in he is going to amplify everything he ever made me to be I'm going to know more purpose I'm going to know more fulfillment more joy more happiness more contentment if I allow the fade to happen can I ask you This morning, as we're talking, what's swelling up in your spirit today that it's time you had it looked at? Why aren't you urgent about it? Why are you doing what I did? You're telling everybody you feel fine. You don't need to be seen. It's all right. I'm okay. When that blockage, that longing is killing you, it's going to kill you if it hasn't already. Can Can I just encourage you? Embrace the fade. Lean into it. Those longings that you have running around inside you, those aren't bad things. Those are just reminders that, hey, you're not going to fulfill that stuff on your own. You can't. So let's stop pretending. You can stop being scared about facing them. You can stop avoiding them. Stop telling everybody you're fine when you're really not. God knows you're not. That's the whole reason that we have comfort that he sent Jesus. Okay, that's where comfort comes from at Christmas. Because even though it feels like you're in a dark, dark room, knowing that that blockage is in you, but not knowing how to treat it, reminded in so many situations this holiday season of how fragile you are, how dependent you really are, and how quickly life can turn. There's a light that has overcome the darkness that isn't fragile at all. It's not fragile at all. It's already at work. And it's already in you. And it's so strong. And it's so bright. It fades out the darkness and it brings perspective and meaning and peace. It gets those wires connected inside of you to things that actually can feed your spirit and help you become who God made you to be. It brings love. It brings peace. It brings joy. And can I tell you a little something? You're lucky you came in today. You are. It's time to get you treated. So let's, everybody, bow our heads. I'm going to close our eyes. I'm just going to ask God into the bedside where we are. 
Jesus, I ask that for every person who can hear my voice, you would draw near in this moment. That by your spirit, we would know your healing, we would know your grace, we would know your touch. Help us first and foremost to know that no matter what the situation is that we're facing, that we're not alone. That our comfort is that you saw our situation developing before we were ever even urgent about it. That you are urgent about the things in our lives that are disconnected, that the longings that we have that are instilled inside of us, that you've given us a way to connect with you. So as we, as we see these pieces of us floating around out there, as we cover them up, as we pretend that they're not there, as we avoid them, would you help us to just pause and remember that if we're going to be real about living on purpose, then we have to be real about where our comfort comes from. Help us to seek it in you. We don't want to be people who cover it up. We don't want to be people who seek it in anything that can't fulfill it. Help us to be people who trust that as we fade out, you fade in, and that your healing and your grace and your love wash over us as we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen.